Today we'll be looking at Proverbs 20, and I want to take you guys through a verse by verse. But keep in mind, we do have a title for this one, and that is Recognizing the King, the True King, Jesus Christ. Welcome to another episode of His Generation Podcast. You're listening to His Generation Podcast, a weekly exploration into biblical truth as we explore the Word of God. His Generation Podcast airs every Sunday morning. So grab your Bible, and here we go. Proverbs 20, starting in verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. This proverb is not necessarily advocating abstinence from alcohol drinks. The description that is demonstrated here is personified with wine and strong drink. Uh, Led astray is probably better translated as intoxicated, like in uh, chapter 5, verse 19, in which the young man should feel like he is intoxicated with the love of his wife, thus keeping consistent with the scriptures about the sin of drunkenness and not necessarily one's choice to drink alcohol beverages. However... This proverb does demonstrate overindulgence. And uh, my advice to those who choose to dabble with adult beverages uh, should first realize their own ability to practice self-control. In fact, here's a good test that I usually practice. I say, can at any given time, can I go without eating for a day or two or more, such as like fasting? If you can't do that, then you really haven't shown your ability to exercise self-control. So I would say, you know, your alcohol consumption uh, should probably be reconsidered. And also to just, if you're one that tends to overeat, uh, you might want to reconsider dabbling with alcohol beverages. Verse two, the wrath of a king is like the roaring of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger sins against his own life. The idea of a king is interesting in Proverbs. It starts in chapter 16 and is further developed in this chapter. Uh, What these type of verses say is important to really dig deep into its meaning. Why? Well, because Solomon, the second generation king of the tribe of Judah, is writing these Proverbs. And he's writing them according to how he has learned from his father, David, whom Jesus' kingly lineage comes from. And this is a very interesting overlay of this chapter, but we'll talk a little bit more as we get over to the latter verses. Verse 3, it is honorable for a man to stop striving, since any fool can start a quarrel. This is frequent instruction of the wise, which simply advises against getting into conflict. Verse 4, the lazy man, and remember, lazy is a devilish characteristic. The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. So a lack of actions to go to work results in dire consequences. This concept goes straight into the New Testament times with the parable of the one talent in Matthew chapter 25, which reads, Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have it. What is yours? But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him. Who has 10 talents. In other words, looking at this parable, we are not to perverse the law of reaping and sowing in God's economy with our passive mockery of the character of the Almighty. Verse 5 Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Deep waters is a metaphor used in chapter 18 that illustrates profound and sometimes mysterious thoughts that require meditative reflecting in order to grasp its understanding. Uh, Two ways I've seen this practically done, for instance, when you're talking to someone, let them speak 
and listen carefully to what they say or ask precise questions that get straight to the heart of the matter. Verse 6, most men will proclaim his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? That term goodness speaks of the kind of love that flows from covenant partners, like a loyalty, bound by love, and yet they have each other's support. However, the proverb also indicates this can be a false claim, and the wise are not to accept friendships just at face value. Verse 7, the righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Integrity is better translated here as innocence. Uh, We have explored this idea before when speaking, for instance, of the true poor. And let me add a few ideas to this. What's the difference between the righteous and the wicked in the wisdom literature? Simply put, it's the intent of the heart when actions are displayed. Just like King David wrote in Psalm 7 verses 3 and 5, as he examined his own heart before asking the Lord to deal with his enemies, it says there in Psalm 7, O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is any iniquity in my hands, if I have repaid evil to him who was at peace with me, or if I have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Yes, let him trample my life to the earth and lay my honor in the dust. Verse 8, a king who sits on the throne of judgment scatters all evil with his eyes. Now remember, this is in context of a just and wise king. And unfortunately, the history of modern monarchy gives us few examples of this. Yet, uh, we know the king of kings who can exercise this perfect action of judgment. Verse 9, who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. Now remember, self-awareness is a quality of the wise, and the wise must be aware that they are not perfect. Just like King David mentioned in Psalm 7, verse 10, diverse weights and diverse measures, they are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Remember, that phrase abomination is a heavy one. So, then why is falsified business transactions such a perversity to the Lord? Maybe we'll find out later on in this chapter. Verse 11, even a child is known by his deeds, whether what he does is pure and right. Like a child who has not yet mastered the art of deception, they are more easily demonstrating their true heart by their actions. And this is insightful because a person will show who they really are by their actions. However, sometimes you have to wait patiently around long enough for them to drop their guard and demonstrate who they really are. Verse 12, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Verse 13, do not love sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will be satisfied with bread. The word love here is ahad, uh, which is the type of love that desires or delights in something. An alert person will not lack provisions. Verse 14, it is good for nothing, cries the buyer, but when he has gone his way, then he boasts. We have read the proverb regarding the deceitful merchant. Now, this is the one regarding the deceitful buyer. Verse 15, there is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Again, this is the proper perspective of true riches that we see throughout these proverb chapters. Verse 16, take the garment of one who is surety for a stranger and hold it as a pledge when it is for a seductress. This is another warning against providing loans to people. So then what do we do to those who ask to borrow money? Well, like previous proverb chapters, we need to consider first showing generosity to those in need. Verse 17, bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth will be filled with gravel. 
the principle of this proverb is material gain by false pretense must first seem enjoyable, but in the end, it shows itself harmful. In fact, think of the simple one caught by the seductress that we read about in Proverbs chapter 7. Verse 18, plans are established by counsel, by wise counsel wage war. The wise do not act on impulse, uh, rather they react after careful reflection. And this proverb here definitely encourages thoughtful preparation before executing any kind of plan. Verse 19, he who goes about as a tale bearer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. Remember, slanderer takes private information and makes it public so as to embarrass people. Verse 20, whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. Now, the word curse here in the context is to take a relationship lightly and not esteem, but rather to disgrace. That's the idea. Now, remember, this is addressing the young man in a family that has God-fearing parents who instruct their children from that perspective. Uh, For instance, if you have a father or mother who is a drunkard (laughs) and loves to use God's name as a curse rather than a form of praise, do you esteem them in their counsel towards you? Exactly. And we must keep that in mind. Verse 21, inheritance gained hastily, the beginning will not be blessed at the end. And then in verse 22, do not say, I will recompense evil, wait for the Lord, and he will save you. The wise do not look for revenge. Uh, They expect God to act on their behalf, just like David in the Psalms, especially Psalm 7 that we read earlier. Furthermore, they leave room for God's wrath. And just like we learned last week about reframing from enabling those who are not truly poor. Now remember the context again. This is in light of Israel using the Torah to judge capital crime and other civil offenses where prescribed punishment is to be administered by a community judge or authority, but not by the individual In fact, this also happens to be the context of civil authority in the New Testament as we read passages like Romans 13. Verse 23, diverse weights are an abomination to the Lord, and dishonest scales are not good. We have deceptive business transactions spoken of twice already in this chapter. Then one should assume or one should guess that this is of great importance for the wise man. Who fears God. Verse 24. A man's steps are of the Lord. How then can a man understand his own way? So planning must always be done with humble awareness that God can intervene and change one's future. Verse 25. It is a snare for a man to devote rashly something as holy and afterwards to reconsider his vows. In this case here, a vow speaks of something made with God in mind of a transaction. In fact, this is why I think this is a great passage for uh, a marriage uh, ceremony. Why? Well, because one should not jump into something holy without first considering the weight of the matter. Verse 26, a wise king sifts out the wicked and brings the threshing wheel over them. Now, this is very uh, in context with the agricultural times of the Old Testament. It speaks of this threshing wheel. Uh, That's what they would use to sift out the chaff from the wheat when they would do their plowing of the the harvest. Uh, But ultimately, if you really look at this, it really reflects Jesus in his final judgment especially when we see there the parable in Matthew chapter 3 where it is spoken of Jesus separating the wheat from the chaff in the final judgment. It says there in Matthew 3, His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So those who repent are the wheat. And those who don't, the chaff. 
verse 27. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. I like this verse because it's a double-edged sword. It can either comfort you or warn you, just like the previous verse that we just read. Verse 26, mercy and truth preserve the king, and by loving kindness, he upholds his throne. This is the concept of God's covenant love, or God's dispensation towards those who love him. In other words, it is the king's attitude towards his subject. It reminds me of a quote I once heard in a teaching. Is he, speaking of Jesus, not a good king to his subjects? In fact, he is a wonderful king to his subjects in which he loves and cares for us. And now the mystery is revealed about the kingship in Proverbs. They speak of Christ as the king with imagery of the king's David and Solomon in their time of peace and love for God's people. They were always meant to be a foreshadowing of the king of kings, the Christ to be revealed in the unfolding redemptive history of salvation. Verse 29, the glory of young men is their strength and the splendor of old men is their gray head. Lastly, in context of time, old age would have meant person has survived so long because they applied wisdom and were successful at navigating through life. Thus, they were one to be looked to as respected, experienced men. In fact, uh, this is how growing old is meant to look. And this should be a lesson for those who are young on how to become the wise counselor in their older years by taking heed to the observable truths of the Proverbs and simply applying them. Verse 30, blows that hurt, cleanse away evil, as do stripes the inner depths of the heart. Speaking of growing older, those who desire to have children one day, uh, this proverb claims that the corrective and loving physical punishment does more than just produce conformity. It also helps to cause transformation of the heart away from death-promoting behavior. However, just so uh, we don't get the idea of uh, child discipline twisted, remember the New Testament verses on this topic. For instance, Ephesians 6, 4 that says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And then also in Colossians 3, 21, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. And let's end on that point for this Sunday morning of His Generation podcast. Until next time, be blessed in the Lord. Thank you for joining us at His Generation podcast. To receive more information about the podcast, please visit our website, hisgeneration.net, or check out our YouTube channel, His Generation podcast, for the video format of this broadcast. His Generation is a production of Generation Mars Media, located in Orange County, California.